Hello, my name is JJ Velopez. I'm a TA for Sys120. I was just cooking an omelet and thinking about functional programming paradigms, specifically higher order functions. What do we mean when we say that functions are values? So let's start with something a little more basic. Before we talk about functions being values, let's look at a simple int. Ignore this. <clears throat> Let x, which is an int, remember the colon, which is, be 5. X's value is 5, and its type is int. X has value 5 and type int. The sum function here, functions, also have types and values. What is the type of this sum function? Well, it takes an int and another int, and then in the end, when you give it two ints, it's going to be an int. So it's int to int to int. It has a type. Does it have a value? So before we had, what was it, let x equal 5. Whatever's on the right of the equal sign is the value of this new thing that we created, x. We can represent sums value using that anonymous function syntax. Remember the word fun. When you see fun, think anonymous function. Anonymous function, it doesn't have a name. Because it's fun to be anonymous. Let sum equal fun. x, y produces x plus y. So remember this anonymous function syntax. You just write the arguments that you're going to be feeding the function next to this keyword fun. You see fun, you see x and y. This is signaling to OCaml. Okay, we're going to take these two arguments and we're going to add them together. So if I were to call sum 5, 6, it would fill 5 into this slot, the x. It would fill 6 into this slot, the y, and it would add them together. And sum 5, 6 is 11. So this is what we mean when we say that functions are values. Sum, what is the value of sum? Sum is a function which takes two arguments and then adds them together. That is the value of sum, fun x, y to x plus y. Right? Whenever you see the equal sign here, that think is, is. Equal is going to show you the value. And whenever you see a colon, that's going to show you the type. So equals is, equals is. Um, and then say that we pass just one argument to sum, sum 5. Well, sum is int to int to int. So if we pass in a first argument, then we're left with something that is of type int to int. So sum 5 is a thing of type int to int. And what is the value of sum 5? Well, think, we're, we're filling in this first slot with 5, so what's left is just a function that takes one argument and then adds 5 to it. So sum 5 also has value, and it has a type. So now that we've looked at anonymous function syntax, let's get to the meat of the video. Higher order functions. We get a lot of questions about these higher order functions, specifically transform and fold. So what is the purpose of higher order functions? Why do we have these, these structures, and why do we teach this in the course? Let's take a look at when we want to structurally recurse over a list. For example, let's say that we have a list of integers, and I want to double each element of the list. My function would look something like this. If the list is empty, then obviously I'm going to evaluate to empty. Um, if it's head cons tail, then I'm going to double the head, and then cons that onto the recursive result of calling double each on the tail. Cool. Now let's say that we had another list and we wanted to triple every element in the list. My function would look something like this. Can you see the similarities between these two functions? They have the same structure. So a big theme in this course is in trying to be not redundant. We want to avoid and, and, and try to prohibit redundancy. We do that when we talk about generic types. We do that when we talk about not being redundant with your test cases. And we're doing it here, too, with our functions, right? How can we generalize something that's just applying a function to every element of the list without having to write a double list function and a triple list function whenever we want to do something that we might be able to just write one function that can generalize all this behavior? So let's start with transform. You give transform a function and a list and it's going to apply that function to every element of the list. So transform, the first argument is some function. We'll just call it f. And f takes something of type tick a, and then once it's giving something of tick a, becomes something of tick b. 
And then you also give transform a tick a list. And what do you think transform is going to do? Transform is going to apply that function which takes tick a to every element of the tick a list. And then effectually the tick a list becomes this tick b list. And that's what calling transform with the function in the list is going to become. So think of it this way. So this carton of eggs is my list. Each egg is a different element in my list. And what's the functionality that I want to do to this list? I want to go down the list and apply a function to every egg. Specifically, I want to crack every egg. So my function is going to be taking an egg and cracking it and outputting, becoming a cracked egg. I could use transform to do this. I would give transform the function that cracks one egg and my carton of eggs, my list of all the elements, and it would do it. So going back to that example that we had before, that double each function and then that triple each function, let's just implement double each non-recursively, non-recursively, no rec keyword, using transform. Right? What are the two arguments to transform? The function that you're going to apply to each element of the list and the list itself. Well, what list are we going to be applying this anonymous function to, to each element of? L, right? This is going to take the L. This is going to take the list. Um, and then what do we want to do to each element of L? For double each, we want to multiply each element by 2. And remember with this anonymous function, we could just use x as kind of like this slot that as this encounters each new element of the list, that's going to be subbed in for x, and then it's going to apply this functionality to it. So similarly, if we want to uh, implement triple each using transform, instead of multiplying each element by 2, we multiply each element by 3 over L. And that's the idea with transform. Fold. People seem to have a lot of questions about fold. So just like with transform, just like with these higher order functions, we're trying to reduce redundancy by seeing if we can generalize behavior uh, when we're structurally recursing over a list, over some tick A list. So we generally use fold when we want to flatten a list into one thing, or if we want to extract one piece of information about a list. For example, let's say that we want to find the sum of an int list. So we want to get this one thing out of an int list. We want to flatten the int list into just a sum. Um, let's just write that function normally first, normally recursively. Let rec suml take l, which is an int list, and it's going to be an int, right? Match l with, well, if the list is empty, then the sum of not empty is just going to be 0. And if it's sum head cons tail, then hmm, let's think. I want to combine the head with the recursive result of calling suml on the tail. And here, namely, I want to add the head to the recursive result on calling, of calling the function on the rest of the list. So we're trying to rewrite suml using fold. Now let's look at the structure of fold, because suml is something that we could implement using fold. So fold is given a combined function, tick A to tick B to tick B. You give combine to tick A, you give combine to tick B, and then it's going to give you a tick B. Uh, a base, which is of type tick B, also the same type as the output of fold, and L, a tick A list. So we're going to match against L. In the case where L is empty, what do we want to do? Well, we want to return the base, just like up here with suml. In the case where the list is empty, what do we want to do? We want to return the base, right? So here you're going to return base. Now, if, it's, uh, if the list is head cons tail, if there's actually something there, if it's not empty, what do we want to do? Well, up here with suml, what did we want to do when we got to an element of the list? We wanted to combine that element with the recursive result of calling the function on the rest of the list. It's the same exact thing here. We want to combine the element that we're on with the recursive result of calling the function on the rest of the list. So this is why fold structure is this way. Whenever you're given a problem where you're trying to rewrite something using fold, whenever you need to write a call to fold, first thing that you want to do, first thing you do, you know that there are going to be three arguments to the call to fold. There's going to be the anonymous function, there's going to be uh, the base case, and then there's going to be the list that you're applying it to. All you have to do is fill in these three arguments. This is the easiest one. What list are you going to apply it to? L. Whatever L the user passes to suml, that's the L that we're going to put in fold. Um, then the base case. For the base case, you have to ask yourself one simple question to, fill, to figure out what goes in that space. What do I want the function to give if the list is empty? If the list is empty, 
what do I want the function to be? Well, look right back up here, zero. If we're trying to sum an empty list, we want it to be zero. So right from the get-go, if you ask those two questions, you should have two-thirds of the work done. Now let's get to the fun part. Fun part, fun, 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 anonymous. The anonymous function seems to be what gives people the most trouble. Um, and the, way to, the question you should ask yourself for the anonymous function is, what do I want to do when I arrive at a new element of the list? So the anonymous function is what happens when we arrive at an element of the list. Remember, these, this x and ack, these are just the two arbitrary names that we're giving to this function, to this anonymous function. And whenever we arrive at an element of the list, it's going to fill in these two parameters, these two slots, with their actual values. So the way that fold works, x is going to be the element of the list. And ack, what is ack? Ack seems to give people a lot of trouble. People say, ack is just the rest of the list. But this is not the case, and this is a major point loser on exams. ACK is not the rest of the list. ACK is the result so far. It is the accumulated recursive result so far. So in the case of sum, ACK is the sum that we've arrived at so far. As we're going and we're summing, summing, summing elements of the list, what is that sum so far? And we have that sum so far, and then we arrive at a new element of the list. How do we want to combine that new element to the sum so far? So how do I want to combine x with this recursive result? Well, I want to add it, right? I want to, when I get to a new element of the list, I want to add it to the result that I've calculated so far. So we put x plus ack. And then you're done. You just wrote a call to fold. So really quickly, an interesting property about ack is that ACK sort of goes on this journey. It starts as whatever you give as the base, so in this case zero, what you give fold when the list is empty, and it ends at the final answer. So in this case, ACK will start at zero and finish as the sum of the list. And as fold traverses the list, it keeps on changing ACK to pull it from the base to the final answer. The reason why it takes a bit too much time for us to go into in this video, if you are interested, come to Office Hours and ask a TA to trace through it with you, trace through the mechanics of, of Fold and of this call. I hope you found this excursion into the land of higher order functions and functional programming paradigms helpful and valuable. If you have any questions, you can feel free to come to my or any other TA's Office Hours or post on Piazza. But for now, I'm going to go back to making my eggs. Good luck on the first midterm. We'll see you next time.